you start caring when someone says like, it's like, why do I care that like these songbirds in San Francisco have different pitches now? And it's like, you should care because like San Francisco's urbanization has caused these birds to change the way that they sing to each other, which means that like something is like as pervasive to us as like the sound of cars can totally alter the way that like a bird sings a, like a love song. Like that to me, I'm like, that's what matters. It's not like, oh, the pitch is different. Hello there. My name is Kit Rackley, my pronouns are they, them, and this is Coffee and Geography. The aim of the show is to get to know, explore, and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people on this rock we call home, and their love and passions of it. We'll find out why guests identify as geographers, and if they don't exactly, We'll have fun exploring all the myriad of ways that connects their life to geography. So, pour your favourite brew, get cosy and listen in. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPot. Off we go. Hi everybody, welcome to Coffee and Geography. And I am rapidly traveling all around the world of late, and um, I'm going back to a part of the world I absolutely love, and that's the Western United States, and I'm joined by Eli Ramos. Hello, Eli. Hi. Yeah, and it's lovely to see you. It's been um, it's been quite a while, um, and I've yep. spoken to uh, an ex-colleague of yours not too long ago, um, Al Snow, uh, who apparently you've you met uh, not too long ago, so... It was lovely yeah. that you got to see them. Yeah, right before they go up for grad school. So that was nice that we got to catch each other. Hopefully we'll see each other again around. Yeah. So I don't know, whatever Al decides to visit their family again. We need to conspire at some point because one of the, um, if, if everybody goes and listens back to my discussion with, with Al, you know, we talked about how we knew each other and that was through the Exploratorium Museum in San Francisco. And we've did that one talk with your cohort for the Exploratorium Stars and Al right. spoke about the stars. And I was like, oh, it's so good to kind of like actually meet you all in person. I love like working with the young people. The Exploratorium is kind of a lot. And now you're all scattered all over the place. So we're going to have to make some kind of excuse of some kind. I'm going to have to make it up to, you know, just outside of Sacramento where you are. So we'll try and sort it out. <laughs> Eli is a Pinoy scientist, creator, journalist with an avid love of all things science fiction. Yes, this is going to be an awesome <laughs> chat. They're an award-winning writer, debater, and producer of podcasts like Under the Electric Stars and The Sound of Your Name. Was that dramatic enough for everybody? <laughs> <laughs> when they're not working on their many, many projects, they put themselves up to uh, that they write songs, look at bugs, and just get emotional about absolutely everything. Yeah, <laughs> my kind of person. Anything to add on that, Eli? I'm, I have to like do the obligatory plug around my podcast. Absolutely. I produce some other stuff. So Under the Electric Stars and the Sound of Your Names are the ones that I've written and produced and done pretty much everything else for. Um, but under Astro Podcasting Network, which I'm the head of, we also make Crown Jewels, which is an audio dramedy uh, about like rich kids who basically ran away from home. Uh, it there's skill set which just came out with its pilot which is about like four friends in a city where like your talent sort of like determines what kinds of powers like and magical fantasy <laughs> weapons ah, nice. you get and then we have another one called spectral evidence which is set sort of in like the fantasy pacific northwest about like a town where a lot of mysterious disappearances happen oh I'll make sure that every single one of these goes into the description of this podcast. And um, actually, I'm going to give a very, very early shout out, and I'll make sure that he listens to this um, person that I met on Twitter, who's become quite a good friend now, um, Andy, who runs the Great Derelict podcast, um, which is all about sci-fi and really getting into the innards of, of, of sci-fi and all this kind of creative stuff. Ooh. And I think I think he would love to speak to you. So Andy, shout out to you. I know I know we're going to get you on this podcast. I've been on yours twice now. I haven't been on mine yet. Um, so yeah, Andy, enjoy this listen. You're going to love it as much as I am. <laughs> right. So um, we're recording evening time here in the United Kingdom. It's but you're uh, you're just coming to the end of the morning. What do you what do you usually drink this time of day? Um, I think like <laughs> I feel like now that I've listened to a couple of episodes of this podcast, I feel like a lot <laughs> of people are like, even though it's called coffee and geography, like 
people are like, oh, I don't really drink coffee. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> um, I'm also very much a tea drinker. Right now I'm mm-hmm. drinking like a blueberry pomegranate tea that my sibling <gasps> gifted me. Uh, and it's very tasty. I tend to go for fruit teas and like low caffeine stuff. Because despite the fact that I do a lot of stuff, um, I really can't do caffeine. Every time I drink mm. something with too much caffeine in it, I just get like a massive headache. And then I get sleepy. So it's like, what was the point? <laughs> it didn't even wake me up. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get sleepy. So I've heard of it. people do it the other way. They're like, I'm going to drink some coffee, take a power nap, and then that will guarantee that I wake up in like 20, 30 minutes. Like, mm. but I've never really heard about it. I'm going to take caffeine as a sedative. It's like, yeah, I'll have that buzz <laughs> to start with, but then boom, I'm gone. <laughs> that's amazing okay so i made a little mention of where you're located so you are in the so is it a suburb is Folsom a suburb of sacramento in california it's well more accurately Folsom is like it's like a city in the sacramento county right so like sacramento is like it's weird because the way that like the cities are like laid out around here like every like you have Sacramento and then there's like a suburb area, which kind of blends into Rancho Cordova and Elk Grove, which also kind of blends into, so everything's kind of like, we just call it under the county. So Folsom is kind of just its own city that exists in Sacramento County. And we, for some reason also just like, don't blend as much into the other things. And I think it's literally just because like, we also have a dam. So that kind of effectively blocks off like a little section here. I think, I think I've um, driven past that. So uh, when I was out working at, in California, um, and we were coming into California from Montana, we would have come down and then we'd have come through Nevada and mm. then, because I think we actually came right past Sacramento, but then again, there, there are quite a few reservoirs around there. So I might just be talking nonsense. I'm just past one of the many reservoirs out there. Sure. Are. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, let's continue with this sense of place. And so as mentioned in your introduction, your Pinoy. And for people who don't know what that is, if you let us know what that's all about and how that's um, part of who you are today. Yeah, sure. So Pinoy is like, if you're Filipino American, usually that's like the term that a lot of Filipino Americans get assigned almost by Filipinos from the Philippines. Um, I tend to use Pinoy because it's like, sort of, I feel that it like grounds my own identity in the fact that like I I wasn't raised in the Philippines. Like I visited there plenty of times, but I was raised here in the United States. So Pinoy feels like it's the right thing. I also like using it over um, like Pinay, which is like the the feminine version of that. But like Pinoy is literally a Filipino word and like Tagalog and most of our like dialects that aren't influenced by Spanish don't actually have gendered terms really. Like we don't have gender pronouns. You just use like Xia, for example, in Tagalog. so I also like, there was like a real push to change it also to Pinoy, but like spelling it with the X, but I was like, our language is like not inherently gendered also. So I feel like I, I'm also just like trying to like stand my ground on like the gender identity aspect of that as well. I know there's just like a lot of really weird stuff tied up in the way that I like choose to like, I like selectively say what my like identity labels are. Cause I'm like, that's honestly, most of my identity labels are for other people to know stuff about me because I'm like right. honestly I I don't mind if people are like oh like Pinoy Pinoy with like an X through the O of it like Filipino all of those things I'm like I'm personally identifying as this because it feels like it occupies like a very specific political niche and also tells you more about like where I've like been as a person. What you just said there about how labels are really for other people's benefit rather than my own that really resonates with me because when I started my gender identity journey Mm -hmm. when when the penny was starting to drop about my my gender identity at first I was using labels to try and figure out myself so Mm -hmm. but every time I came across something someone else I'd meet with a group of people hang out with them chat with them and then someone would say oh yeah you know I'm quite gender fluid I'm like what's this this is sounding really and then so I was I was coming across diff- all these different terms and when I thought I was getting settled on one thing then another I'd discover another one I'm thinking actually it's so much more complex and more nuanced and of course we're all unique individual human beings where we it's you know being gender diverse is trying to break out of boxes not trying to put ourselves in boxes right. so yeah you're absolutely spot on with 
nowadays it's more of a case of I've settled on specific labels, but it's less for my own benefit and more for other people's benefit to kind of like say, this is who I am. Yeah. And, um, and I was, uh, as everyone knows, and you know, I, I use they, them pronouns as well, mm-hmm. because I, you know, gendered pronouns don't really fit very well with me, even though I'm more comfortable with she, her than I am with he, him. So to hear from a geographical point of view, being, you know, being a jog through, it fascinates me. So you're saying that in Filipino language, there is no gendered terms. Is that in terms of pronouns or in terms of, uh, or in general, like in French, they're very gendered, but. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's funny you bring up French because I actually took French in high school uh, and I was also just like, wow, sure are a lot of masculine and feminine words here aren't yeah. there uh <laughs> filipino language like as people know like the philippines was like colonized and then imperialized like <laughs> three different times uh so yeah. it i think in some ways like because of the way that like the english language also has like genders to them and spanish obviously also is like gendered there are gendered terms that have like made their way into our language but i uh, like gender pronouns specifically are like pretty fluid uh it's like the term for like the general catch-all term for like gay people and trans people in the Philippines is bakla, which is like putting together the words for babae and lalaki, which is boy and girl. Mm. Uh, so there's already like, a, I think in some ways, like the language kind of has embedded in it, like that, like A, it has like the whole history of colonization embedded into it. And B, I think like having things like, non-gendered terms or terms that you like put together just sort of speaks to the variance in how like pre-colonial thought was about like sexuality and gender i realize now that i am i've still got so much to learn um for trans day of visibility this year i wrote an article for um the decolonizing geography website um Mm -hmm. because in in that group i'm I mean, I, I don't. No one else has said that they are, and they've not disclosed it. But as far as I'm aware, at the moment, I'm I'm the only uh, trans queer person in that group. So it kind of I offered to write the article from a decolonizing perspective, and mm-hmm. I made it very very clear that I I understand that you know even the term transgender is a colonial kind of term, is a Western term, mm-hmm. you know, with regards to because you know you've got gender diverse cultures out there, and they and they don't necessarily call themselves transgender or gender queer or something like that they're they're western terms it's because they they just have that those people exist in their culture already why would you need to label them otherwise so right. but then to hear what you've just said as well on top of that is thinking it's it's actually heartwarming in a way that i've still got so much to learn so and the article that i wrote was was i tried my best not to be reductionist and i did say i appreciate that even the term transgender is a western construct and this is more about using Trans Day of Visibility as a vehicle to make sure everyone is aware that there are cultures out there with huge gender diversity. And mm. it's not strange. It's not, you know, out of the ordinary. In fact, it's very ordinary. Um, so, yeah. So I think, look, you know, perhaps we should uh, get together and have a little chat to uh, discover this more because I'd really, really love to learn a bit about it more. And uh, it sounds yeah. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So, uh, right. Okay. Let's really crack on with some really fun things here then. Right. right. You say that you love to spend lots of time thinking about science and nature, and you use that quite a fair bit in your writing, both as a creative writer and in your journalism. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular kind of thing in science fiction or in science or in real life science that, that really does spark your imagination really does give you give you your muse like is there like a favorite show a series a writer a sci-fi writer or or program that does that for you well this is okay so this is kind of like interesting in the sense that like i usually say like when i say science fiction i like i'm always talking about like a really really large like genre like the genre is like huge massive right um and i feel like every time i say like i really like science fiction people are like always like oh space stuff like space, all the yeah. stuff that happens yeah. in space and i was like no i re- i actually really like science fiction that happens like on earth like and or if you're going to put it in space like where they go to planets and stuff where the planets have like interesting and diverse like environments and stuff because i just feel like 
I, whenever people are talking, especially podcasts have like a, there's like a very classic like podcast format where it's like, oh, people are stuck on a ship that's in space or mm. on the ocean or something. And then you just kind of get like these interpersonal character dramas. But then I'm like, that's really cool. But also like the whole point of space and like science fiction and stuff to me is to explore the science in it. That's not just like, hey, we're on a ship. <laughs> um, yeah, right. So I feel like usually the stuff that really inspires me um, and one of the like, it's usually music is the, like an interesting thing. Also, there are two concept albums that I really like. One is Janelle Monae's Dirty Computer that was in, released in 2018. Uh, and Janelle Monae just like already had a lot of like science fiction concept albums where it's like, here's like this world where like it's it's Earth, but also technology has taken over like a lot of these things. And this is all these like systems that are set up and like what are the ethical questions to be asked of like if people can alter their brains or whatever like how far can you go with that that's really interesting to me the other one is my chemical romances danger days uh album because yes i love i really like the aesthetics in there i really liked the comic that they ended up like having afterwards but like i feel that the concept album also like takes place first of all i just like really like california's geography and environment in general so like the fact that they were like yeah danger days takes place in like californian desert like straight up it's just california and i was like yay my state (laughs) um so i i just really like that it was like grounded in like actual conflicts that feel like they're extension of like issues that we would have in california because i feel also that like science fiction as like a genre is sort of meant to explore and understand things about like so here's our world take it like farther what are we Mm. critiquing right like that's always the best science fiction is stuff that actually does like an interesting job of critiquing things so it is weird to me when like science fiction is like too too fun almost where it's just like yeah and now we have aliens i'm like but but, (laughs) like tell me more tell me more about like what's interesting about that and like the societal implications of like having a society of aliens like i really like for example also ursula kayla Gwynn's left hand of darkness because right, i was yeah. just like yes oh my god when i get to read about like a whole society's like social construct just looking at my bookshelf i've got a few ursula uh, Gwynn stuff up over yeah, there yeah yeah so i know that was kind of like a long answer to things that That's i just like great. in general like but <laughs> yeah this is why you've you got to get in contact with andy at the great derelict podcast because that's what he talks about quite a lot. And we're, we're actually going to be planning to t- talk about um, District 9 as, you know, kind of in yeah. that kind of way of of how that, you know, and then talk about how that's representative of things like the apartheid, you know, and mm-hmm. stuff like that, which, you know, that is use, in, use of science fiction to explore that very, one, one of many disgusting parts of human history, um, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, there's also... I talked, we talked about Thunderbirds, the puppet show, the Jerry Anderson puppet yeah. show. It's one of my favorite things of all time. I've got models all over the place and, mm. and whatnot. So we talked about, about that as a concept. And, uh, and we did talk about Star Trek and Star Wars, but from a imperialism, de, you know, co- colonial kind of aspect. So mm-hmm. all of these things, actually, I mean, I, I do love, you know, I'm a massive fan of Star Trek. Everyone knows that. But I actually more enjoy the kind of the culture and and the the world building and that's why I like Star Trek so much because it's more about the world building and all that kind of stuff and uh, rather than just you know Captain Kirk trying to get the girl shooting a few pew pew pews yeah you know so um <laughs> but one of my favorite books um was the Wind Up Girl uh, by Paolo um, Biacchilupi um, which is a fascinating book it's a science fiction book but it's set I think it's set in, I think, Thailand, in Thailand, 23rd century Thailand. And it's global warming and climate change has completely screw up the world. And the only reason why uh, the place that is set is not underwater is because they've built this like giant, massive, great big sea wall, which is holding back like the ocean. And if you venture out past that wall, not only is it a vast ocean, you know, it's stormy and it's, you know, it's very inhospitable. And yeah, and they're talking about how... Um, you know, everything has been walled in and how society has really become, it's, 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 it's almost Blade Runner-esque, mm-hmm. you know, the way that cult, the culture is. And it's interesting that it was set in Thailand rather than, say, New York City or mm-hmm. some, or even the Bay, you know, the San Francisco area or something like that. So, yeah, that's I love that kind of stuff. That's, that's my kind of, um, 
really in deep sci-fi kind of stuff so yeah um it's so what about the environment do you kind of take a scientific view in terms of using pl- place and environment and nature in your stories as well or do you take a is that coming as a separate component um i think that like most of my stories i try and ground it a little bit in like my own personal experiences of like environment right because like under the electric stars like the sci-fi thing i write was just like in some ways is like me being like, I have a lot of things that I like talking about in science fiction, like what's the nature of humanity and like, what does it mean for like people to like connect with each other in a world where like connection is like not as valued, those kinds of things. But, and I just like also think though, like in some ways writing under the electric stars is like my love letter to every place in California I've lived in. Cause I've moved around a little bit. Like Folsom is my hometown, but like, I was living in San Francisco for a little bit. I was like down in SoCal for a little bit. So like there are places that I've just been all around here. And it was like to write that story was for me to like say like, okay, what are like the issues that I personally have like dealt with in California? How do I take like these places that I love and put them into the story and like talk more about in some ways, like the historical context of those places. Cause like we're in season two now and this is not like a major spoiler. So like the, the new location that they go to is just like, my hometown basically like the my whole like hometown area and what it was like growing up there and like there's this mall that I used to visit that I was like so that's like the setting for where this is and also for me to be like all of these places are built on like indigenous grounds like what does it mean for us to like talk about sci-fi and talking about like how indigenous people like basically never well like people of color in general don't seem to show up prominently in a lot of like popular sci-fi and so then to also be like, okay, and then also how do we, how does indigenous science play into science fiction? Like, what can we say about those things and connecting them together? Um, and then like my other thing, The Sound of Your Name was like me foraying into fantasy, which I like, I got to be honest, even though sci-fi and fantasy are like buddies, I hate writing fantasy. I'm really, really <laughs> bad at it for some reason. I like, because every time people are like, let's come up with like a magic system. I'm like, no, no, I can't do it. <laughs> like, it's hard. I want there to be a robot so I can just explain things. <laughs> Um, be, a, be a perfect melding of the both. Yeah, very I, true. I, I don't I, I quite like the sound of a cyborg gun <laughs> precious. But I need some input. Yes, yes, we need some input. Some stupid, dataless thing. <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean that excuse. would be super great. <laughs> <laughs> cyborg golem. <laughs> but um, let's see. What was I saying? Oh, um. The Sound of Your Name is, like, based in Southeast Asia, because I was, like, I don't really get to see a lot of fantasy that's written about Southeast Asia and is, like, also written about how, like, for me personally, I was, like, my experiences of Southeast Asia are that, like, a lot of places where you have, like, indigenous, like, communities, again, I feel like I talk about indigenous peoples a lot, but uh, they're just a theme of my work, I guess. Um, But I was thinking about how I was, like, yeah, like, my entire family grew up in like sort of the more rural provinces of the Philippines and there's like people who will just sort of like take over those areas and be like this belongs to us and then indigenous communities have to be like okay uh still gonna just live our lives out here like it and like the way that like changes of power like materially affect people that are living in places so I feel like those kinds of things also inform it also just like both of those stories that I spend a lot of time like writing and producing um, are also about like how does geography affect like the resources that people have access to there like California uh, like even literally like right now there's like a really big fire near me again because it never ends I guess in fire season but like that's like a major plot point of season two for under the electric stars also is like, yeah. Like if you have a lot of like people that you move out to areas that are going to obviously be more susceptible to fires, especially when you're like, you know, putting like big power grids and stuff everywhere Mm. that are liable to catch on fire. And then I was like, translate that translating that into like a science fiction world where like, of course everything is electric now. So everything needs power. So how much worse do like these like, conditions get for people who have to live out there like was something I really wanted to address because it's like something that affects me also and I feel like all of those things are like tied together in like a really inextricable way in the way that like I wanted to dedicate to the places that I have lived in. One thing I've said in previous episodes that when I used to be a high school geography teacher I used to like to use creative um, 
you know, creative arts or storytelling in order to teach geography. And mm-hmm. I think that, and just as I was sitting there listening to that, what happens to me, Eli, and as I almost, I almost zone out, not, not by not listening to you anymore, but I actually, I, I really do take what you saying deeply. And then suddenly some plan formulates in my mind. And now I've got this kind of, Oh, if we can get that story that you're writing about the fires, and then we listen to that as a creative, you know, output, and it's a fi- fictional story, but based on these these true events, these true processes, these actual processes, and then take the geography out of it. Okay, so this is. Do you understand? This is how this is impacting people. Now, what? Now, let's have a look at the real one that's happening in. Ca- you know, I think mm-hmm. that. Um, I, uh, my regret is is that I don't think I. I did it a lot, probably more than the average teacher, I reckon, but I still don't think I did it enough because mm. I, I think there's such a power into using story, be it either true or fictional, to teach about the world. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I was already intrigued at, at looking up some of your stuff, but I'm definitely going to going to see, looking into it now about how, with a, like almost a teacher's hat on and see if uh, see if there's some learning um, out for it because I think it's... <sighs> Um, I know we did, I know we said a bit earlier we didn't really want to go into the politics and stuff, but you know everything that's kind of been stripped down now with COVID and and all the things that's happened with climate change, we're kind of like getting more and more insular. Is that and focus on oh yeah, it's all got to be about the economic output or the recovery's all got to be about economic. Well, what about the arts? Mm-hmm. Because a that work makes what life worth living, mm-hmm. and b if you don't have the arts and and the creative that's taking place out there, how are you going to nurture human beings who've got that imagination that flair to take something that could be worthwhile for the for the community or for okay economically as well it's like you take away the arts almost like you know you're, you're pulling a thread from from everybody and it just all falls apart so it gives life meaning yeah um i think in some ways like when i think about like my own education through science so many scientists that I know and like really like and kept in contact with after school are people who were like, yeah, like science fiction was like my jumping board into doing science. But then like right. science education is like, all right, now let's do some equations and figure out these things and like put together. And it's like, obviously that stuff is important. That stuff is like part of what makes science run. But I also think that like the lack of emphasis on like how arts and science in- interact with each other is like so, it's like very short-sighted. Like I think it's a major reason why I wanted to go into science communication rather than just doing like lab research. Because like in the current spaces of like science for me at least personally I don't feel that there is a lot of room for storytelling outside of being a science communicator because like really yes like the stories are what make things matter to people like I think like the heart of like a lot of people's interaction with each other is storytelling um and so it's weird to me almost that like people will like put out a study and be like great now people can read that i'm like you still do need to make it so that like the average person can be like why do i care that like mitochondria does this thing what a yeah. great way of putting it yeah yeah not do i understand it why do i care yeah yeah because it's like there's so much stuff where it's like after i explain it to someone they're like that's so fascinating but i am like you you start caring when someone says like it's like, why do I care that like these songbirds in San Francisco have different pitches now? And it's like, you should care because like San Francisco's urbanization has caused these birds to change the way that they sing to each other, which means that like something is like as pervasive to us as like the sound of cars can totally alter the way that like a bird sings a, like a love song. Like that to me, I'm like, that's what matters. It's not like, oh, the pitch is different. It's like, you have completely changed like a generation of voices for a species like look look how crazy and incredible that is but also sad in some ways because of course it's like to a certain extent how much can you get them to like change their vocalization before like the old patterns of singing are like lost forever and also that like can you push that pitch to a point where they they don't sing anymore to communicate with each other because there is no way to like go over the sound of traffic you know those are the things that matter out of a study i think that like i really want there to be more science communicators who think in the ter- in terms of storytelling you know one of the things that fascinated with me when i did a little stint at uh, at noaa in boulder colorado with the climate scientists there is 
how much of there was of a need for people like us, um, mm. you know, who have got, I, was, I would say, at least adequate amount of scientific understanding, you know, and by that I mean of the research that they're doing, you know, right. at, at such a deep level. Ad, ad, definitely for me, it was just adequate. It was no higher than adequate. <laughs> um, and, but also the fact that some of those scientists were very good at talking, public speaking, but and I spoke to one of them about this and uh, Arlene, and she said to me, it's a lot of scientists don't know how to communicate it in other ways other than to other scientists. And for those of us who do enjoy public speaking, um, we cannot commit the time that we would love to, to develop public speaking and scientific communication because of you know the the pressures on doing the research of mm -hmm. yeah you know getting our papers written out and stuff like that and and just just the culture of it all it's 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 so so it's not conducive to kind of public engagement mm -hmm. um so there's there's a couple of pressures on them and so there's me you know little little like kit rackley high school geography teacher being welcomed into a major worldwide global research center of some of the world's top climate scientists feeling that i'm there to to plug a need that they have and that was right. humbling and very very um very surprising and a big boost for me but it also was quite sad in the way of thinking you guys are so incredible and amazing at what you do and you need basically you know a, by in comparison to their knowledge and understanding a layman to kind of communicate this your stuff for you <laughs> so yeah. um so yeah i mean and then I, and then there was me and a couple of others in other departments that would work together to do public tours and school tours and stuff like that and the number of times i lost count that as a scientist would turn around and say okay i never realized we could have that was a really good way of putting it. I never thought about putting it that way or, or produce or presenting it that way or making a video out of this or do building a model out of this. We never thought of that. That's a great idea. I was like, really? I used to do this with 11 year olds all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think like at a certain level of like thinking, you sort of start like the, the ways that you used to like model out stuff just sort of seem like, very far away from you like I think he, like I've worked with kids a lot like I was a camp counselor for a while I've like volunteered at museums I also did stars which like part of that was like trying to develop some yeah. stuff that would have been like more like yo younger ages appropriate for like talking about scientific stuff right um and I think that like a lot of scientists just haven't thought about that for a really really long time because they're like oh that's high school like whatever about high school whatever about middle school like this is like the real work i'm focused on now but i don't know like i think it's good to get in touch all the time like you should always be in touch with like who your potential audiences are because like your audience like what's the point of creating a message if nobody hears it you know or if like nobody really wants to engage with it like yeah or as you said earlier no one cares yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and you know there are plenty. There are plenty of scientists out there who do an amazing job. I mean, there's, of um, you know, at the, at the university I work with, we've got um, Ben Garrett. Uh, hi, Ben, uh, and I've mentioned Jenny before. Jenny Barkley, volcanologist. Hi, Jenny. You know, they are two. Ex there are two examples of 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 researchers and scientists who are amazingly great at public mm -hmm. engagement and scientific communication. And I think half the reason why they're so good at it is not only they're just talented communicators, but they're so passionate and they live and breathe and bleed what they research you know yeah. um and it's and you know you find for example you'd, well, ben ben just gave a talk about um climate change um at norwich cathedral but not just any talk about climate change at norwich cathedral it was on the basis of uh, dippy the dinosaur there's because they've got a massive great big uh, diplodocus um yeah, and Jenny just likes making things explode for people. <laughs> so, you know, but it's, yeah, I think passion and, and of course, uh, so many scientists there are, are, are passionate, of course. That's, that's not a question. It's scientific communication I didn't realize was such, I would say, I wouldn't say niche. I think there's so many people out there do it so well, but so needed, mm. you know, more so than I thought. I thought I'd be someone out of, many 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 people who just do these things but actually there's apparently not as many as us as they should be apparently 
Yeah, I mean, like, I think obviously, like, I think a lot of people are science communicators and don't consider themselves science communicators mm. because I'm just like, yeah, like, I, I like currently work at like the Sacramento Yellow County Mosquito and Vector Control District, which is basically like we have like there's West Nile virus. We have invasive mosquitoes. And we also like we have like a public relations person. And I'm like, you are a science communicator because you have to tell people about like how these things transmit and stuff. And you have to make it digestible, not only to like people that we go door to door to like talk to about like, hey, we just detected this in your area. This is what it does. But also to like kids and also to like people who like don't speak english as their first language and people who like i i think like i was talking to our pr person recently and i was just like yeah like i think it's really neat like it's science communication stuff she's like that's such it's interesting because like that's like a very new ish term like relatively speaking obviously but like she was like i wouldn't have considered myself that until like people started bringing that up to me so I guess I'm being a bit unfair because, like, sign- you're right. Scientific communication doesn't have to be about catching people and making people go wow, you know. So it is about those people who deal with public relations. Like, there's some kind of, like you mentioned the fires earlier. There's there's people out there who need to communicate with regards to this is why you can't go down this road. This is why you must stay out of the area. Yes, we may have contained the fire, but you've got to stay out of the area for this reason. Well, they are. You're right. They are technically science communicators because. They, they will tell you, well, you know, you could have what's called zombie fires. They could kick off at any moment. The wind may change, you know, mm-hmm. um, something's become unstable. And it could, if, if too many cars and traffic go over that, it could collapse, you know. So, yeah, they, right. they are effectively science communicators. Um, yeah. So, no, that's that's uh, you've reined me in a bit there to uh, in a very healthy way. So that's great. Thanks for that. Um, right. Let's talk about something else then. When I asked you about could you anything you couldn't link to geography um you're not the first person to said oh that's just so difficult i can't really do that but what about animatronics and theme parks <laughs> which is funny because the other stars in turn i talked to of course was our snow and we talked about theme parks as well so that was completely <laughs> coincidental everybody listen back to my discussion with our where where they and i talked about making a theme park and we're going to bring eli into this as well because <laughs> Al and I have already talked about kind of, we were going to call it like fun and therapy or therapy and fun and stuff like that. Mm. And Eli's going to come and bring in the animatronics. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to be our, our third partner in this, but. Oh boy. <laughs> what, what, what's, does animatronic just fascinate you then? Yeah. So I, I kind of joke about this with people because every time someone brings up a topic, I almost always feel like I'm like, oh yeah, like for a little while as like a kid or as a teenager, I was like really into that for like a month or two. And then they're always like, what was going on in your life that you were just like constantly like swapping out interests? I'm like, I honestly have no idea. I just like, like people are like, oh yeah, like leopard geckos. I'm like, that's right. Like for like three weeks as like a, as like a 14 year old, I really wanted a leopard gecko. So I like could not stop just like studying everything about leopard (laughs) geckos, you know? But animatronics is probably like one of the long winded ones that I've just had kind of for a while where like, I think from like between the ages of like, I want to say like nine to 16, I was just like, oh my God, I love animatronics. And so like, I, like I was constantly like looking up stuff at theme parks. Like I hate, I really hate like roller coasters. Really. I don't like them. If there's a big drop, I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not into it. <laughs> but if there's an animatronic on the ride, I will go to see the animatronic, even if I don't like the um, other parts of it. Cause like Universal Studios, right. Has the Jurassic Park um, right. yep. ride. And I was like, I'm so gung ho to like see all of the like animatronics here. And I know that there's like a 25 foot drop at the end, but I don't care. I do need to see the T-Rex animatronic and I need to like observe it and like see how they're like putting stuff up. It's so it's just like one of those really long winded interests I've had throughout my life. Oh, that's so cool. And yeah, one of my, one of my biggest loves uh, you know, linking back to science fiction is is the uh, puppet series uh, Thunderbirds, which of course yes, is, yes, which Jerry Anderson um, called you know dubbed the term uh, super marionation because he combined animatronics and um, puppetry, so mm-hmm. which is incredible. Where they used the solenoid to make make uh, the Tracy brothers talk at the same time that the actors were saying mm-hmm. that yeah, it's, oh, it's just so good, and the eyes <laughs> and yeah. things like that. That's pretty cool. So I'm thinking uh yeah so the last time i went to a theme park like in the usa i think 
it was either Disney Disneyland in California or Disney World in Florida, one of them anyway. But but I was thinking the um oh what was it called? The one with Br'er Rabbit and uh, Oh the Splash, Splash Mountain. Mountain. Splash Mountain. That's that's the one with the animatronics I really, really remember. You know, mm-hmm. Johnny Good charge your bond. And like just <laughs> like, just seeing them all and just going for it. And then of course the big log bloom drop. But of course, what's one of the most famous animatronic Disney ride of all time? And Everybody's going to hate us now because they're going to get that song stuck in their head, including you. It's a small world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Classic yeah. animatronics, that one. Yeah. I I do remember, like, as a kid, like, my mom, like, my mom and dad obviously, like, were like, okay, we do have to take our kids to Disneyland at one point. But I do not remember the first ever trip I took to Disneyland because I was too young. But I yeah. do remember being on the It's a Small World ride. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, colors, look, a fake alligator. Like, that's, like, the one memory I have from my first ever trip to Disney. Because I think I must have been, like, five or six. So, like very very few actual memories of that right it was the episode the simpsons which takes the mickey out of all of that and mm. i to realize I just did a pun uh, <laughs> but yeah so they 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 make fun of of um it's a small world by having all of them turn into like killer robots and stuff like that and itchy and scratchy right. land and and that kind of dodgy abraham lincoln one that goes evil right. and tries to chop everybody's head off and mm. <laughs> oh we could kick yeah. out about that another day yeah. Okay. I'm getting totally random now. It's just. No, you're totally fine. You know, I think it's interesting though, also because like I still like animatronics. Clearly, like I could I could talk about them all day. But I also um. So here's some st- like a couple interesting random Go stuff on. on my end. So first off, I have moved around a lot, but I've also moved around a lot just in Folsom. And I used to live next to a guy who, well, like not right next to a guy, but like next to the. Our houses were near each other. Um, <laughs> but every Halloween, he had like a bunch of animatronics. He was like, yeah, I just straight up build them. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And so he was th- talking about how he had like taken like a lot of times old like uh, like boardwalk attractions and stuff where they have like a little haunted house section you go through. A lot of times they don't do super well. So like they have to sell off their animatronics. So he was like, yeah, I just take those and I repurpose them and like reskin them and stuff to make new animatronics that I just display. And I was oh, like, awesome that's super neat uh and i spent a lot of time just like talking with him about that this was like on a halloween where i was still of age to be trick-or-treating so like i'm just standing there and he's like dropping candy into other kids's like things and i'm just like oh that's so cool and he's like yeah so this uses like a solenoid coil and he's just like (laughs) (laughs) um so there's that and then the other thing is so like any gen zer who also has to run social media stuff i am on tiktok uh and a lot of people were talking about animatronics recently because like not super super recently but like five nights at freddy's video game that features animatronics there's other stuff it's like it's all horror stuff so people are scared of animatronics now but there's like a very specific fear for of animatronics that are submerged in water that a lot of people seem to have and i was like that's super interesting to me there's like a very famous um animatronic that like people used to post as like a scary picture to like send around to people which is Bert the Bunyip, and I have completely forgotten where it, it is, but it's it's literally just, an, it's a coin-operated animatronic that's underneath a bridge, and it just, like, pops out of the water and growls at you if you insert a quarter, <laughs> right? Um, and people were like, oh my god, it's so scary, because it's like, of course it got water damaged, people weren't taking that good care of it. It's like, it's a coin-operated animatronic in, like, a park, like, no one's, like, really tending to it. But I was just like, that's so odd that this is like a, a fear that like thousands and thousands of people seem to have. <laughs> like... huh. And that's and then when they have this kind of like the AI singularity when it approaches, it's not like it's going to be, you know, some kind of kind of bot that looks like Wally, you know, from from yeah. Pixar. Movie. It's more like it's going to be the kind of this dodgy looking, yeah, like humanoid puppet looking thing that's going to, you know. <laughs> break all the rules you know yeah. i'm going to i know you said do no harm to humans but i'm going to corral with you. now i'm going into the <laughs> i am legend bloody um not i am legend what was it uh oh i can't remember what movie that was now i robot it was yeah, the other one with go. um with will smith <laughs> <laughs> will smith on my mind right okay we're gonna bring this wonderful conversation to a close so um you mentioned the word this is so so much of a coincidence you mentioned the word uh invasive right and mm-hmm. funnily enough so the person i spoke to last time was uh white raven woman candace lloyd who's mm-hmm. uh, a matisse woman from 
the Ontario area. And when she did her We Are Geographers challenge for 30 seconds, she absolutely smashed it because she, she mm-hmm. was given the word lens by, by Nia Cole. Um, and so she talked about indigenous lenses and brilliant, which is fantastic. And then when I asked her what word she's going to come up with, she actually used the word invasive. So oh my gosh. that was why it's so coincidental that you mentioned a bit earlier. So I don't know whether that's going to make it easier for you. Really, I, think, I mean, I feel like it makes it super easy to link that with geography because it's like the reason why invasive species exist is because of like globalization. So taking animals from one geography to another, like right. Well, I'm going to time you before you go on because as you've le- as you've listened to the other episodes, it's all timed. It becomes more <laughs> pressure cooker. Right. So I'm going to set the thirty seconds, and then you just get to riff for thirty seconds about the word invasive. Are you ready, Eli? I'm ready, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So 30 seconds on the word invasive. Off you go. All right. So like invasive species, for example, exist because you take like an animal from one geography to another. So like because I was talking about mosquitoes earlier, Aedes aegypti from like the like Egypt, as the name sort of implies. Now it's here. You have a lot of invasive species because they can like kind of take over because the geographies are kind of similar, but they outcompete other species. I think that that's really interesting. There's tons of other like really neat invasive species examples. That's like a really easy way to link it to geography. Yeah. Yeehaw. That's my speech and debate skills kicking in when I see a timer Absolutely. and they tell me to speak during it. <laughs> yep. Boom. That's it. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't said boom for a while on this podcast, but I'm going to use it now because it's very much deserved a boom. Right. Cool. So, but you get to have your, your, well, that was way too easy. Is it a case of having your own back or is it just passing on the love? I don't know. Of your own word. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to give to the next guest, Eli? Gosh. um, You know, I feel like. I feel like I want to choose from like the conversation we had, like a, yeah. a an interesting one. So I'm gonna choose like a weird word tangentially related that like a bunyip, like I was saying, Bert the bunyip earlier is like a cryptid. So let's use the word cryptid. I want to see someone link that with geography. Crypt- cryptid. Yes, cryptid. It's like you know, weird mythological yeah. kind of animals. We'll see where the oh, next love person it. takes that. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Wow. Okay. So um, we've already given a shout out to the wonderful Owl. So hi, Owl. Me and Eli say hi. hi. Owl. And all the other wonderful stars, I guess. Um, yes, so with with those those in the bag, is there anyone else you'd like to say hi to? Oh, my gosh. Uh I feel like I should just say like hi to all my friends who I make listen to podcasts that I'm on (laughs) because every time I guest on something, I like send the link to all my friends. I'm like, hey, I'm in it. You can listen to my voice even more than you usually do. (laughs) I know that Um, feeling. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like I should also shout out all the people who I work on my podcasting network with because I'm also going to send this to them. So uh, shout out to Inigo Sherwani who writes Crown Jewels, Aiden A who writes Skill Set and Calliope Monroe, who writes Spectral Evidence. Hi, hi, y'all. <laughs> hey, buddy. Yeah, I'm. Oh, uh, I'm gonna. I'm actually looking forward to the commute again because mm-hmm. I haven't listened to as many podcasts as I used to with my commute, and um, I'm quite quite fortunate that I've got, I've got an electric car and I can just mm-hmm. cruise in the back roads up to Norwich and just put on a mm-hmm. podcast. And yeah, so. Come on, let's get back to <laughs> I've in the corner of my living room. We listen to these podcasts more. Yeah, no, and and please, please, please do do send me all that list of the wonderful links and stuff because they are going in the description and everyone can have at those at their heart's content. Right. Yeah. And speaking of which, so oh crikey, how many how many connections have you got? So you got TikTok, Twitter, or do you on Twitter? I can't remember if you're on Twitter. But anyway, where can people find you (laughs) uh most honestly like my tiktok i'm like i check the pulse of like the the internet there i don't really use it that much but like you can find me on twitter especially at mix eli ramos m-x-e-l-i-r-a-m-o-s that's probably where you will see me the most um and you can also find me much much more actively running the astro podcasting uh twitter so ask at astro podcasting on twitter also if you want to ask me about science stuff though ask me on mixy like robles <laughs> <laughs> well there you go so you've got two channels that you can um get eli on there fantastic yeah and uh, i'll definitely get um andy in contact with you because i think this is just gonna i think he's gonna love this right yeah, so 
Eli, this has been an absolute pleasure um, geeking out with you on a uh, Sunday night, as it is at the moment. Um, yeah, it's been a great way to end the week. Fantastic way to end the week. So thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me here. It's super nice. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favorite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep jogging.